welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we're taking our cue from Jacob in the evening of his life and heading down to Egypt to discuss the ancient Egyptian mindset regarding death, burial, and the afterlife. And of course, there's a myth for that. Today we have an app for everything. In the ancient world, there was a myth for everything. Uh, So Greg, would you like to retell for us the myth of Set and Isis and Osiris? Hmm. All right. Osiris and Isis were children of Ra. They were divine and sort of human. And they were the first king and queen of Egypt. And what made Osiris so very, very cool was that he invented beer. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. Beer and ale, he, he, he taught people civilization and the, the crown of civilization, apparently, was beer and ale. So having thoroughly civilized the Egyptians, he set out to civilize the world because, well, his gifts were so well received and he got lots of applause and write-ups in the paper and things. So he set out, but while he was gone, his brother set the Dark Lord. Uh, <laughs> I, his throne and his wife, and look for an opportunity to possess them both. But before much could happen, Osiris comes back having thoroughly enlightened the world with beer and ale. And so Set uh, continues in his envy and jealousy and decides that his brother has to go. And he comes up with a very clever Mm -hmm. approach to axing out his brother. He throws a party. And he invites 72 of his best friends. Apparently, none of them are Osiris's friends. You know, when you are invited to a party where everybody knows the host except, well, you know him as your brother, but you don't know anybody. You know, that that doesn't that never works out well. But it, it didn't work <laughs> out well here either. Because um, Set, surreptitiously, had obtained Osiris's dimensions. Maybe he had... Osiris go to the tailor and get fitted for his suit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But somehow he, he tape measured him off so that he could have his carpenter, a furniture maker, produce a box, a coffer, a chest that would be exactly the right size for Osiris to step into comfortably. And having um, had this box made, he then overlaid it with gold and gems and made it all cushy inside. And so he throws the party, and while everybody is drinking themselves drunk on the very good beer and ale that uh, Cyrus has provided, Seth stands up and says, I I, I, I have a party game. It's a door prize. See this thing here? Isn't it beautiful? Everybody says, ooh, whoa. Um, I'm going to give it to, oh, I don't know, anybody who who could just fit into it perfectly, I'm sure. You know, you're, you're kind of tall, you're kind of fat. It's, it's not going to fit everybody, but so, surely somebody here will be just right as they step <laughs> the, into the it. The glass slipper will fit some lucky. The glass slipper, yeah, will fit somebody. And so one by one, starting with all of uh, Seth's cronies, they, they step in. One's too fat and one's too thin and so on until we get to Osiris. And Osiris was just the right size. No sooner has he stepped in than everybody grabs the lid, slams it on, nails it shut, and throws it into the Nile. <laughs> and thus, Set is free of his goody two-shoes brother and can uh, take over the kingdom and the bride. Except the bride has vanished. She is no place to be found. Because Isis is going to look for her husband's body. Because the assumption is he's way dead by now. Suffocation, drowning, something. But it turns out that the currents that lead out of the Nile, out of the Delta, down the coast end up uh, north of Palestine in Phoenician territory, a little town named Biblis. And there the coffer, now a coffin, uh, gets stuck in in a a tree that was just beginning to grow and its roots grow up around it, apparently rather quickly. And the tree uh, encases this coffin. And so the coffin, the body in the coffin, in the tree, are just there while Isis comes along trying to find them. And um, being a uh, less than forthcoming goddess, she decides that she will dress the part of a traveling nursemaid, traveling wet nurse. That's a weird job. (laughs) (laughs) My wife says that's a weird job. 
<laughs> and she presents herself at the palace where the queen has recently had a baby. And this is just kind of tread water and look around and try to reconnoiter and figure out what happened to the coffin. And, and she does, but in the process, every night she has to tend to the baby. I don't know, the king and queen are going out to the movies or something. And so having nothing better to do, she blithely decides that she will grab the child immortality by roasting him in the fire every night to burn off his mortality. Well, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the that. fun, that's a, don't about, recommend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's about that point that the king and queen come home early and find the baby in the fire and snatch it out. And Isis reveals herself in all her glory and says, you fool, I would have made him immortal, but now he's going to be flesh and blood like you. Ha. And they realizing they're talking with a goddess, do what mortals do when talking to goddesses in the ancient world. They say, what do you want? This is, um, that tree out there, it's got my husband's body in it. Okay, well, that does, yeah, sure, you can have the tree. It means nothing to us. And so they chop it down, they stick it on a ship, and they, and she sails it back to Egypt and manages to, at some point, dislodge the coffin from the tree. Uh, and she, she brings it into the marsh regions of the Delta and finds a cave and hides it there and goes to look for divine help particularly Thoth, the god of magic and healing and such. Well, unfortunately for her, while she's gone, Seth's spies have been keeping their eyes open and they, they saw her re-enter the kingdom. And they found the cave and they found the coffin. And so they pry it open and they find Osiris's body and they chop it in pieces. And they go and they spread it all throughout the delta. And so when Isis comes back, hubby's body is torn in pieces and she cries and all of that and in well she doesn't have a body to cry over so first uh talking talking with uh with thoth and um perhaps other details i don't remember the details she gets in her little boat which is made of papyrus because crocodiles will not attack papyrus they don't like it for some reason and is she that goes, a true uh, fact or is that myth apparently that's a true fact Wow. Which helps to explain, by the way, something we're coming up on before too long, and that would be Moses. <laughs> mm -hmm. His little hmm. ark being made of papyrus and stuck in papyrus. Contrary to all the movies that show it floating down amidst crocodiles trying to snatch at it. <laughs> anyway, so she goes pulling her way through the Delta and is able to find all of the pieces of her husband's body, all but <clears throat> one which thereafter would be worshipped in Egypt in their fertility rituals. Moving on. So where that came to that part, she had a clever wax duplicate made. And she took the pieces of the body and she, with the help of Thoth, bandaged them up, tied them back together, bound the pieces back into a convincing form of a body. And then she herself fluttered over it in the form of a dove and somehow became virginally pregnant hmm. and in time gave birth to the second sun god horus come back to him in a second egyptian god of the sun <laughs> yeah remember to put that in the show notes too <laughs> so anyway he um uh, osiris comes back to life but not here it's not like his like all of those wonderful little horror movies where the mummy gets out and gets up and starts walking around. That's not what they're talking about. What they meant is that Osiris's essence was not destroyed. And so on the other side, in the afterlife, he could maintain his uh, spiritual integrity, structural integrity, and continue to exist as a real personality and becomes enthroned as the king of the underworld as well as now the god of resurrection. But see what just happened. Resurrection now means not the arising again of the flesh, but it means the preservation of the soul, or the ka, they call it, into the next life. And as long as the body is preserved in this dimension, the soul maintains its integrity in the other dimension. That's the Egyptian doctrine of the resurrection. And sometimes you will you will run into people, and your little horror's comment is much to the point here, who say Christianity was just copying the Egyptians because they had their doctrine of resurrection too. No, they didn't actually. What they had was a doctrine of the survival of the soul 
if you manage to take care of the body here, if you fail, goodbye soul, the devourer of souls, the great crocodile god, would chomp on you and devour you in its intestines for centuries until you finally cease to exist. But if you could preserve your body here, your ka, your soul self, could survive into the next world. That's the Egyptian doctrine of the resurrection. And the ankh, the cross with the circle on top, that's what it commemorates. The scarab beetles, not Christian resurrection as we understand it, but this, this hope of some kind of conditional survival beyond death. Now, Horus goes on to grow up and fight Set, uh, who assumes the form of a great monster, and the, the Horus eventually slays him and takes his place and all that. But Osiris never comes back into this world in any sense that we would consider resurrection life or being really here, really now, really with it. But he remains the god of the dead, and now when the Egyptians died, if their bodies could be preserved here, their souls could pass on and go and stand before Osiris, and Osiris would act as judge, and the soul of each man, each woman, would be weighed against the feather of truth. If the soul was find, found equal to or lighter than the feather, then he could pass on, as Osiris had, into the underworld and become his own little Osiris, his own little god, the divine essence surviving in him. If, however, he failed, if his if his soul was laden with sin, then he would be thrown to the devourer of souls, this crocodile hippopotamus-like god who shows up in the pictures, it's ready there to devour you, and it takes a long time as you move slowly through its digestive system, its intestines, and finally are gone. Now, the one other thing that we want to throw on this, is that this for the Egyptians then, a couple of things were really, really important. One, maintaining the existence of the body in some kind of recognizable condition. Now, whether or not the pyramids were really that, there's still debate on for a long, long time. We assume that's all the pyramids were. Now there's a lot of people saying no, because one, we've never even found a body in a pyramid, but you could the Valley of Tombs, there's no question what was going on there. They were preserving the bodies with their stuff because the stuff you need to you want to have a comfortable life. And in the, the, the graves of the commoners that we found, we see the, much the same thing on a much smaller scale. The basic stuff that would seem that would seem basic to a poor man's life is buried with them because it has to travel with the soul to the next life or its image, its impress does. But the other thing is um, when you stand before the gods and, and you're asked if you're worthy, you probably aren't. Because you're probably a scoundrel. Because you probably did bad stuff or didn't do enough good stuff. And um, you and, and, and gods are, you know, you, you never can tell with gods. So what the Book of the Dead, Magic Spells, did was to teach the departing or departed, where souls could actually read the words as they slipped over, the spells necessary to calm their heart before the gods and basically to blind the gods to the obvious, which is, <laughs> I've been a complete jerk, but you won't notice that now. I am not the one you are looking for, <laughs> except me as I am. And so there were ritual words that you were supposed to say, and they lar largely were negative. I've not done this. I haven't done that. I haven't done this. I haven't done this. Receive me. They were the, those who did the burials were very careful to bind a scarab over the heart, lest the heart, the conscience, give the soul away at the wrong moment when the gods look at you in the eyes and say and have you you don't want to say I'm, 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 I'm. no is it like you the know? telltale heart where you yeah. would hear it happening so it's like oh no it's just this little scarab beetle yeah he's making yeah. all that noise so, so the, there you go these There's gods are really not that clever if that <laughs> well and again it does tell you something about how the ancient world thought about magic even the gods were subject to magic and you could pay a great deal of money to your favorite sorcerer to prepare your body for the next life. And that meant teaching it how to cheat the gods with magic. Mm. So there we go. How does that strike <laughs> you two in terms of the Christian doctrine of the resurrection? Because obviously resurrection is resurrection. It's all alike, right? Mm, about <laughs> that. I've been talking recently with several people just how prevalent Gnostic-like ideas are. And this one is 
less Gnostic than you would expect. Yeah, they actually care about there, the body. <laughs> there's still something about the physical form, yeah. but its only purpose is in the integrity of the spiritual uh, existence after death. So it's still influenced by Gnosticism, obviously. But Well, it predates yeah, Gnosticism, is, but it's the same idea. Or it influenced yeah. Gnosticism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of, one, <laughs> yes. All the same thing. Yes. There's nothing new under the sun. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you compare that to the, the, the Christian doctrine of the resurrection, where A, it is not by any of our own merits mm-hmm. that we partake in resurrection on the final day, and also that our resurrection is a true resurrection, a reunification of our spirit and our body now glorified, but ri- the, it's the same body. Mm-hmm. It's ours. Mm-hmm. It's the other part of our human existence that is actually and truly vivified and brought back into union with our with our breath, our spirit. Mm-hmm. And also completely different from any pagan system is the fact that this isn't anything we have anything to do with. <laughs> it's not, you know, I said the right things to the right God, and then that God owed me a favor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's God gave me faith in yeah. him mm-hmm. and then counted that towards me as righteousness, just like our father Abraham. And then for his, the sake of his son, in whom I am now found, raised me up in a resurrection like his. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Now, something that was implied in everything you said, but I think it's good to make it explicit. Please do. <laughs> we come back as creatures. Mm-hmm. I know in, in times past I've asked, I've made that point with my class, younger younger kids, and you will be raised again as a creature. We, well, we have to be creatures still? <laughs> you know, I can forgive that in, in junior high students or ninth graders, but I think there are a lot of adults, even within the church, who are caught a little off guard by the doctrine of our eternal creaturehood. Mm-hmm. We, because in the pagan world, what you are resurrected to, what you are translated into is divinity. You leave behind your creaturehood in the Egyptian system. There's still that, as you said, that thin connection, that thin wire back to the original body, which the Gnostics very nicely dissolved because they didn't like even that much. But the the goal of paganism since Eden forward is to be as God. Mm. And it's pretty clear that the physical elements of this world somehow are lacking in divinity. And there has been this ongoing attempt to reject the resurrection of the body in favor of something more spiritual. Because, well, God's spirit and we're spirit once we get to our bodies. So we're just, you know, like gods, aren't we? <laughs> That reminds me of the Mormon doctrine, mm, where they've yeah. not only deified man after death, but they've humanized God the Father. It's like yeah. he's our literal father, and he's not really any different fundamentally from the things that we see in creation. Exactly. And the, this is all something that you know every pagan worldview shares is there is no real creator right. in their cosmology or in their their ontology. Yeah. So Christianity is really the only one that comes cl- anywhere close to having a creature creator distinction. Yeah. And hey, we did an episode about that. We did an episode. <laughs> review. Go back in time to that yeah. other one um, for all the discussion about that. But it it mm-hmm. there's just nothing in these in these worldviews that fundamentally separates the mortal from the divine it's it's all mm-hmm. something the greeks called it the you know the ladder of of being or mm-hmm. whatever the actual term for that was sorry <laughs> um it's yeah everything's on the same level yeah just differences of uh, degree you can yes. have your really thin um cream of wheat or your really globby <laughs> gobs of cream and wheat but it's all cream of wheat it's just I, I, I have divine stuff. You maybe have a little more divine stuff. But I bet I could get more diviner stuff than you have and be more of a god than you are. Give me time. Now that sounds like Carl Sagan. We're all made of star <laughs> stuff. 
yes. which is again doing the same thing that everything that is is fundamentally the same yeah metaphysically yeah. But if you call it star stuff, that sounds so much better than oh, yeah. we're all hydrogen, helium, and nitrogen. <laughs> we're all protons and neutrons. Isn't that great? Doesn't that give you great hope for the future? No. Mm, actually, no. <laughs> but call it star stuff. Stardust, yeah, even. Stardust, yeah. It's more all poetic. Kinds of, all kinds of romantic possibilities on that one. Uh, along these lines, as I usually do, I'll take it back to school. In a Sunday school, small children... What does it mean to be say? It means you die and go to heaven to be with Jesus. Now, there is certainly truth in that. Mm -hmm. A believer upon death mm -hmm. does go to be with Jesus. And we don't want to deny that or cast any shadow on that. And but I also appreciate how it addresses the problem of death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is what Jesus defeated on the cross. Yes. Sin and death. <laughs> but it doesn't end there because... Uh, the the end of the doctrine of salvation is the resurrection of the glorified body into a new heaven and a new earth, a redeemed creation. And to leave the soul separate from the body as if that were the end of the story and that's what it's all about and kind of misses the whole idea of salvation or redemption, of buying back what was lost, of making right what went wrong. Uh, it basically says, well, you know, Satan won in the garden. So God came up with plan B, which is even cooler because it doesn't involve any matter or cre created kind of stuff. It just involves the pure soul of man. So we'll let Satan have the first victory because we don't care about the world and the body and sex and sweat and work and, you know, all that kind food. of stuff. Food, food, wine, you know, we mm -hmm. don't want that. Uh, but as long as we get to keep the soul, that's all that's important. Mm. And, and even if it's not conscious, we do need to be very careful of the way we speak. As my wife says so many times, how you talk about something is how you think about it. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about salvation in terms of dying and being with Jesus, that, that gives us great hope if death is near, but it also snatches, us, snatches from us the much greater hope of the resurrection, mm -hmm. that it does not end there and, and our bodies are not so much trash to be thrown away. Uh, we, we plant the seed in the ground with the sure and certain confidence that God will raise it to glorious fruit mm. in his time in the last day. So other things to consider as we, uh, as we look at the importance of the Christian doctrine of the resurrection. And uh, what, what's interesting is that as we've been doing this podcast, it ends up oddly enough coinciding at least on certain tangential points with what I'm reading in Augustine City of God. Mm -hmm. um, in the first book, I think it's the first book, he is responding to criticisms of Christianity from pagan Roman citizens who essentially blamed everything about the sack of Rome on the Christian religion supplanting the old pagan religion. And one of the criticisms that these uh, Romans bring to Christianity is, look, when the, the pagans came, so many of your Christian uh, people were, were slain, and there were so many bodies that we couldn't even bury all of them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have no hope, because the body is, is gone, and you place such stock in, in the body. And hmm. can Augustine's... you imagine that complaint being lodged against Christians today? Oh my. No. <laughs> oh, that's great. Work, no. <laughs> but what's great is that Augustine's response is to essentially say, okay, first of all, so did a bunch of your guys. <laughs> <laughs> and second, your own poets, I think he quotes Livy, say, you know, when when you the Roman soldier dies in combat for Rome and has no covering but the sky ahead. He is still most blessed of all, for he has died for his country. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and then he, um, he, has, he also makes another great point, which was specifically, look, I'm going to, this is a very truncated version, but he basically says, you realize we think like that God made everything <laughs> and sustains every atom of our existence. I don't think he's going to find it hard to find our bodies <laughs> because they even turned to dust in the grave. Like it, you couldn't put that back together. 
as mm-hmm. as the dust of of bones but god says he can i'm i'm pretty sure he'll be able to find our bodies in the deep <laughs> of the sea <laughs> and in uh the fields and the meadows where they have they have fallen slain by robbers and and barons and such he's like you guys are n- this is this isn't the dunk you think it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> This is a good time to talk about the Christian doctrine of burial. Yes. Okay. Okay. One, there's a Christian <laughs> doctrine of burial. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, uh, just thinking off of what of what Brian was saying, it would be easy to slide along and say um, that therefore what we do with the body doesn't matter mm-hmm. because you know God can bring it back no matter what. People can deface it. And it's it. God can still work His purposes there. So, given that God is sovereign, you can can pull everything out in the end anyway. What does it really matter? That's roughly the same thing as saying God has predestined all things. So, um, uh, my sin is um, you know just let's do good that evil may come because my sin's all part of the predestination, and my choices don't really matter because God can override them for good, and all things work together for good. Uh, yeah, no. It's not the uh, argument that <laughs> Paul recommends that we use no, with ourselves. It's, no. it's, it's, it's not. And, and again, it is comfort to those whose loved ones have fallen overboard in a storm or been uh, consumed by wild animals or some horrible disease that left them uh, horribly disfigured, burned in, in, in a car crash or a fire or some such thing. Or yes, cremation. A, or cremation. God can sort that all out. We don't have to worry that somehow we're going to we're going to miss them, or that when they show up in the resurrection, they're going to be short in an arm, or their face is going to be <laughs> disfigured because God couldn't pull this one off. So there is still that there. Insofar as we're looking for comfort in the face of evil in this world, yeah, absolutely. But does that allow us the what is the word I am looking the authority to to, to treat the body of our dead loved ones in horrible ways. No, let's just go to real, let's make it really simple. Let's think of um, Swift's little um, piece of irony. Modest proposal? Oh. Mm-hmm. Yes. I remember this? Oh, yep. yes. <laughs> if, we, if, if the body is nothing, why not grind it into food? Feed the starving children. Perfect solution. And he goes, no, but that's horrible. Why? If if burning well burning it's not that bad. Interesting thing, my own denomination just is, I think it's probably still finding this one out oddly enough. Um, but one of the people on the committee to write the, the the paper on cremation versus burial actually works at a crematorium. He hmm. said, um, "You guys, it doesn't work the way you think it is. It's not just you throw it into the flames and it turns into ash. You you first you heat it up." And you you consume some of it, but the bones are still there. So then you take it back out and you grind the bones. You smash them. You crush them. And only then do you finish the the fiery work and and, end it all up. There's nothing neater, neater, nice, or reverent here. It's not just an alternative. It is something you would never do to anybody or anything that you loved. If you had to do it personally. Yeah, yeah. And yet we can... Write it off Someone... as a savings on a funeral expense sometimes. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, but the document, and, and here's something, and Brian said this earlier, and I, I didn't catch it well enough at the time, but I thoroughly appreciate it in retrospect, that I may be found in his son. The I is not just my soul, it's not just my spirit. And the Holy Spirit who indwells me indwells me both as with regard to my soul and my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you read through Romans 8 carefully, you will see that the that the Spirit raises us up because the Spirit is still in us. The Spirit does not abandon our bodies any more than he abandons our souls. And so to take that, that is still me. Um, yes, Dad. But you know, you know when, Sarah, when Abraham buried Sarah, it doesn't say Abraham buried Sarah's carcass or corpse or a piece of meat or something, organic matter. Because he buried Sarah. Mm-hmm. Um, when I go into the tomb, it's going to be me, a dimension, it's a part of a dimension of me. And that dimension is still claimed by the Holy Spirit. And so that the Holy Spirit who dwells in Christ and in us will raise up our mortal bodies. And there is great hope and great glory and confidence in this doctrine. And again, it flies in the face of, well, it's cheaper. 
the cheaper is not the thing. And we have Jesus is our great example. I mean, if there was any, ever somebody who could have said, don't fuss over my body, I won't be there anymore, and said it with authority, it would have been our Lord. And yet we have two of his disciples, rich men, coming and spending an enormous amount of money on a burial that's going to last three days. Hmm. And at no point did Jesus sleep behind any telegram. <laughs> well, three days ago from Jerusalem, here, Nicodemus, Joseph, Arimathea, this shoot. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, dear Joseph, stop. <laughs> Nicodemus, stop. Don't waste the money. Stop. Be back in three days. Signed, Jay. You know, it, um, he he willingly consented to it and made the whole thing part of the gospel stories as evidence of what had really happened. He was buried and anointed and covered and cocooned in this stuff as so that when people walked in, they could say, they're the burial clothes. And this isn't something that somebody just, you know, tore open a zipper <laughs> and walked out of. This is something you can't get out of without some kind of incredible power. Oh, and Oh, look, there's the napkin folded up and put to one side. I, I, my own suspicion is that his mother always told him to put <laughs> your clothes before you leave the bedroom. But uh, being an obedient son uh, and that and, and perhaps also as further testimony to the resurrection. But he could have done that without folding it. The folding, it shows conscious attention to detail, mm -hmm. even in the face of the most glorious miracle, saving the incarnation itself. So there, there's a lot here to think about. And sometimes I think we just get fixated, at least people that I know just get fixated on. But this is what Uncle Jim said. This is what we were prepared for. That's what I psyched myself up for. This is cheaper. It's, it obviously has got to be okay. Besides, I know so many people who've done it. Well, you know, a lot of people have done a lot of things. And that's not an argument. And if you find yourself making it, you should know you have a problem. Once we find ourselves saying, well, look at all the people who are doing it. You should just stop right there and, and question yourself. What you should be saying is, where does the Bible authorize you to do anything like this? Mm -hmm. And what does it authorize? Over and over again, you plant the seed in the ground in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the last mm -hmm. day. And it's also worth noting that if someone did have their bodies cremated, we shouldn't take that as any kind of signal that they're not actually saved or not actually going to oh, be right. right. It no. has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Just want to get that out. No, there. yeah, no, that's good because sometimes <laughs> we, we get stuck in things that, it, like, and this is something I think it, given the somewhat lofty terms we talk in sometimes, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to keep reminding ourselves and everybody that people do a lot of things because they haven't been taught any better. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. probably do some things because we haven't been taught any better mm -hmm. because there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to know. And, even even down to the uh, Sunday school teacher who says, "God, children, God is like an egg." Uh. There's the shell, you know. <laughs> yeah, we could all scream, but that teacher simply may never have been taught better. We have to be very patient with such things, and yes, introduce in, in instruction as soon as possible. <laughs> um, and so I'm sure there are people who have gone through cremation because no one in their life honestly challenged them with what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. And certainly cremation does not hinder God's power right. to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. But that's not the issue. The issue is what is pleasing to God? What has he shown us in his word? And we all learn something new every year, month, whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for some people to learn some things. And if we get to be the channels of that, great. Um, on the other hand, if they're not going to listen to us right now, maybe they will someday. Yeah. Well, this is rather a morbid discussion. <laughs> but yeah. I would like right. to... It's the resurrection. How could this be morbid? <laughs> Because a resurrection involves dying first. Oh, right. Okay. There's that dying that has to be got <laughs> over. Um, but there's such a beauty there that when, even when we are dead and gone, in a sense, our bodies can still testify to the resurrection. And that's what mm -hmm. burial is, is this testament yeah. that Jesus is coming back and yeah. we will be raised again. And this body's not done with. Mm -hmm. it used to be a um, beautiful tradition, although not without its difficulties, of people, of the church, of each church having its churchyard where you bury people. Mm -hmm. And the idea was very simple. In the resurrection, when Jesus comes back, the whole congregation over successive generations will stand up together and great grandma and grandma and mom and baby and, you know, we'll all be there together with all of our friends and all of our family. 
Not, not that God can't put, again, can't put the pieces together, but the symbolism and the hope expressed in that are, are very mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until a couple centuries of burying people in the same narrow part of ground and floods coming <laughs> along and dislodging things showed that maybe there was a, a safer, more sanitary way of doing this. But uh, the original impetus was, was full of great joy and hope. And I've seen some of the, the cemeteries in England around the old churches and just beautiful kinds of things. And if we, uh, if we go back uh, again to the idea that we're, we're found in Christ, one of the great creedal declarations of our faith say, says that Christ descended into hell. In other words, he went down into the body of the earth. It doesn't say his body did. Mm -hmm. it, it was still him. And if that same idea is present for our own selves, then we should be in awe that salvation doesn't just include, it's just not, it's not just the spirit. It is the spirit and the body, even when those two are separated in death. And I'm going to go ahead and play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Go ahead. Jesus was not put in a box six feet under. He was put in a cave. So really what all Christians should be doing is obtaining land with caves and putting their dead in there. And? <laughs> so, so this whole concept of, you know, the churchyard is totally uh, unbiblical and unwarranted. Uh, it is true that most, and perhaps, I, I can only think of one time in scripture where the language might bear that the body was put directly down to the earth. That was the the burial of Elisha that gets interrupted the way it's phrased, at least in our English version, suggests that the body was simply let straight down into a, into the ground. But uh, be that so or not, the analogies that Paul and our Lord use are putting seed in, into the ground, not into a cave. I, I, there may be a fine point of theology here that if left left the wrong way for a thousand years might pervert everything <laughs> but i'm not it's not a hill i'm willing to die on you want to go find a cave great uh there's much to be said for caves far more than for mausoleums i think because mausoleums aren't exactly underground but caves in the heart of the earth sure why not you want to go do that you want to make that argument it's wonderful it's better to make that argument than the other for cremation and if you think if you think that's the only way, you either have to cremate or you have to go find caves. All right, go find a cave then. <laughs> you've, you've done the argument. You may now live with it because you've said that that's the alternative. And, well, we know cremation's wrong. So if the alternative is going and finding caves, go find one. Uh, and it's on you now. But I'm not quite sure that that's what, what God is painting for us in Scripture. I listened to a podcast from Art of Manliness, an interview with an author who had spent some time with his father uh, on a woodworking project. And the project was building their own coffins. <laughs> and he starts off and he's like, now this sounds like really, to use the word again, morbid, unhealthy, dark, but no, it was, it was a really beneficial exercise and I re recommend it to anyone. It, it was a fascinating interview, so I'll po post it in the show notes. But that, I mean, there's another way to put funeral costs down, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Build your own <laughs> and spend some time meditating on the resurrection while you do it. We are, our world, this generation particularly, is scared to death of death. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about it. They, they, we, we introduce all kinds of euphemisms. You know, as Christians, we have the right to use the biblical language of falling asleep in Christ. He's not dead, but sleepeth and things like that. But the world doesn't get those. And yet they try to keep using, he's passed away. He's gone to a better place. He's, you know, they, he's dead. We don't want to say that. It's just, it's just frightening because people, they, this is all they know. And the thought of something after death is not all that comforting for them. If you could, if they could be sure that no matter how they live now, the afterlife would be a sweet, wonderful place, maybe. But they don't have that assurance. They know they don't have that assurance. Uh, and so they spend an awful lot of time avoiding death, avoiding talking about death. And if you were to do that, 
to suggest building coffins, you would be accused of all kinds of weird things. But what a wonderful opportunity to talk to your children mm -hmm. about death and resurrection and about the shortness of life. Dad, where are we going to keep this? Well, dear, I, uh, I'm guessing you're going to use it within 15 years. Dad, don't say that. Um, it's reality. We need to look reality in the face. Maybe God will give me 20. But if I pass the you know, three, three score years and 10, I'm already on a gracious time. So, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we look for all kinds of opportunities to talk, we being Christians, to talk to our children about marriage and birth and conversion and church membership and baptism. Maybe it's time we, we reinserted some rather healthy and pointed discussions of death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm and that we retrieve the history of Jesus from the fairy tale, never, never land, Bible pieces, places, Bible people, Bible times mm -hmm. into, no, he really did die and they really did wrap up his body. And yeah, they were working with a corpse when they did that. Mm -hmm. And then that corpse came back to life. That's what resurrection is. The dead person stopped being dead. Neurons started firing, the brain waves started, um, uh, coming back online, the heart uh, started beating, the lungs pumping, his flesh warming. He got up and he walked out through the cave, outside, out through the walls and down the garden path. And his feet made impressions in the sand as he did. <laughs> he was really alive. And the resurrection is the one point, well, one of many, but one really solid point that the Bible really highlights where we can't get away from history. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when Paul summarizes the gospel, he says, not simply that Jesus rose again, but he rose again the third day. Calendar history. Mm -hmm. It was a particular day. And if he didn't rise again until the fourth day, the gospel is a lie. It's, it's, it's pulls, the resurrection pulls us back into history and to matter, to time, to physical substance, to life and breath. And yeah, into, into death and some things that people would think are morbid. We have a realistic faith, and we need to keep insisting on that. Mm -hmm. And that brings us back to something we've recommended before, is that commentary on Ecclesiastes, Living Life Backward, where he reads through Ecclesiastes. The first couple pages of each chapter are just the book of Ecclesiastes, and then his commentary follows. Um, but he makes a lot of this point, that if you are looking forward to death as a certainty, what impact does that have on the way you live? Let's recover this concept of dying well and living well in preparation for death and even beyond that to the resurrection. And I, I've read the book. I wish he had been more explicit about the in Christness of it and of the mm -hmm. resurrection. I have no doubt yeah. that he believes it all. But I think yeah. because there are so many people who don't make the connection, it mm -hmm. would have been well had he underlined it and said, and this, how is it that we fear God and keep his commandments? How is it that we have the ability to live life backwards? Well, because yeah. we live in the light of the resurrection. Yeah, totally agree. Jesus resurrection. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. All right. We should wrap up and make some recommendations and sign off. That sounds so, good. Who would like to go first? I can go All first. Right. All right, Brian. Okay, my recommendation is smoking meat in the style of Southern barbecue, which I was able to do uh, using a makeshift smoker box. I went to the local Walmart and picked up wood chips, and I put them into a aluminum bread loaf pan and then covered that with foil and poked holes in the foil and put that over the burner until it started smoking, and then I put meat in my gas grill and five and a half hours later, I had a, a really nice smoked brisket. So if you have patience and um, ideally an actual smoker, <laughs> it makes it so much easier. <laughs> um, I recommend uh, smoking because then you can get some nice homemade barbecue if you Brian don't. recommends smoking. This, yes. The FDA has not approved this statement. That is correct. <laughs> yes. You know, if, if smoking is so bad for you, then why does it cure salmon? <laughs> oh, oh, um, oh, that's um, my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Greg? 
Um, I think I'm going to go with C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory, which oddly enough is in his little book entitled The Weight of Glory. It's a collection of essays. <laughs> and uh, the reference, of course, is to Pauline language. Emily, help me remember, Weight of Glory is from Ooh, um... Corinthians or far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. When we look, it's got to be Second Corinthians. I think it's Second Corinthians. My wife eight. says yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, the the point is, well, first of all, he addresses the idea of glory. What is it? What does glory mean? And he says, as a young Christian, it it is it seemed to him it either it meant that you became a, a human light bulb, or that you became really famous. And to him, both seemed abominable. I mean, who wants to glow all the time? And being famous seemed just to be full of pride until he realized more and more that it does mean fame and that that's how the saints of old meant it. But the fame is fame with God, to be known, mm. loved, appreciated, highlighted, welcomed, greeted by the only one whose opinion actually matters. <laughs> and then once we get that, that in Christ we are glorified, we are welcomed, we are crowned, we are... Uh, made like Jesus, we are made adopted sons of God. When we realize that about ourselves, and then we begin to take ourselves seriously, but not with, like, here's that word again, with a morbid pride, like I'm all that, but wow, look what God has done in me. Oh, it's, it's just amazing. It shouldn't be me. In fact, it's kind of funny. It should be me. We, we, we're able to, to take ourselves seriously in the right way but be able to laugh at ourselves and another. But then secondly, we're able to look at other people who are the image of God and take them seriously and realize that although there are many imperfections in this life, as the, as the image of God, there is a glory there. And that one day that glory is going to be manifest and among the saints, they will seem as, they, they may seem as nothing now, but they will seem angelic as, as if they were gods Whereas there will be others who, with the common grace of God removal, seem like demons. Mm -hmm. we, we live in the presence of immortals. People to be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. We need to take one another seriously as God would take us seriously. For Jesus' sake. Not mm -hmm. because of our stuff, but because of who he is and what he's done with us. So that's one of a number of essays I also, in the same book, would recommend. Membership, which talks about how Christians... Are members of the body, members by definition being different from one another, not all the same, therefore complementary and not a bland unity. So, weight of glory, C.S. Lewis. Wonderful. Uh, my recommendation is a podcast called Books with Bert. That's Bert short for Burton, so B U R T. Uh, it's a former professor of mine, um, Burton Folsom who's written a bunch of books on the economic history of the United States. So he's been reading through his book, The Myth of the Robber Barons, and he is on the podcast exactly as he is in person, which is as cheerful as it is possible for a human to be. <laughs> he's just so overwhelmingly exuberant about what he's learned and sharing it <laughs> with you. So his class was super great, and this podcast is super great. And as his books are super great. David and I have read one or two of them together. So books with Bert. He had a recent episode on Christianity and capitalism where he looked at the life of Rockefeller mm. and said, how did his faith affect his entrepreneurship? And mm -hmm. what is entrepreneurship really, but servant leadership and considering how to serve your neighbor. So highly recommend those. Excellent. And that's all the time we have for today. So... Thank you guys so much for being here. <laughs> Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. And thank you to you, our listeners. If you'd like to support us, you can do so at our Anchor homepage, which is anchor.fm slash Zion. if you'd like to give a monthly gift uh, to help us keep this show running. Thank you so much. Hope to see you next week.